So hello guys and welcome to the Q&A session uh, with the answers. Uh, there are a lot of questions and they are still coming in. So probably I'm going to do two um, sessions, two parts of this Q&A. And I'm going to start, um, well, answering some of them right now. And well, later on I will do another uh, Q&A answer session to answer the rest. I'm going to try to answer as many many of them as I can okay maybe some of them are left alone but they are a ton of questions so well let's get started and I'm going to start with the most more like personal questions first and then with the in-game related ones if I have time I don't know exactly how much is going to take this and I don't want to put a monster video either so well let's start it let's start a uh, question I get, I have gotten a lot uh, is uh, where I'm I from and uh, if I am a pilot. I am Spanish and I'm living in a city called Toledo, which is 75 kilometers southwest from the capital, Madrid. And uh, um, well, I've been I've been living here for several years. It's a place I actually live lived uh, before when I was a kid. I'm, I was born in northern Spain in a city called Bilbao and well yeah that's more or less it. Uh, am I a pilot? Uh, no. No I'm not and um, I simply can't. I mean I can't get a private uh, pilot license but I can't be a professional pilot. I was born with um, defective eye in my defective eyesight in my right eye uh, which is got which got some pretty nasty graduation and um, well even while I have a perfect left eye my right eye has always been like a little bit crappy uh, I got it um, more or less corrected some years ago with laser surgery but the problem is that to be a professional pilot you have to pass a series of, of medicals with very strict requirements of eyesight and correction is not allowed so I simply can't be a professional pilot so that's it it, it was actually a, a dream of me when I was a kid to be a pilot but well I can't be a professional one what are you going to do? more questions have you ever flown in real life and if you have what kind of aircraft? oh yeah I have couple times um, actually three to be precise the first one when I was 17 years old and I was trying to um, find a way into the um, air forces of the Spani Spanish army. Um, I was, uh, I mean, my one of my uncles uh, was um, a medical captain in the Spanish air forces and he had some contacts and I went to an interview with, with uh, one of his friends who was running a... Um, uh, an air academy in Cuatro Vientos in Madrid. Um, well, basically, I was told that there was no possible way for me to um, cheat my way into the into the air forces because even if I was able to cheat in one of the medicals, sooner or later we will be, I would get uh, spotted. So well, that was a pretty big hit for me, and I was very sad. And the guy asked me if I wanted to take a ride in a plane. And I was like, "Oh, hell yes!" And I was well, an instructor was introduced to me. Uh, he gave uh, me a um, general turnaround of the plane on, on the ground, the general checklist you have to go before taking off. And the guy very soon noticed that I knew a lot of planes. So as soon as we got into the cockpit, he just said. Okay, switch it on and let's go. And I was like, what? <laughs> so yeah, I actually took off, uh, flew around for a while and then landed. And um, well, it was incredible. I can tell you that. Later on, I have flown a couple more times uh, because I have some friends who have pilot license, a private pilot license, and I have flown with them. And as soon as we are in the air, they simply lend me the controls, and I have actually landed another one of them. So yeah, I have flown in real life. As for the what kind of planes, I don't remember the model of the first plane I I, I flew in the in the air academy. Uh, but I do know the other mm, two times I have flown, um, there were Cessnas 172s. Uh, next question. Got a sister? Oh, yes. 
I have two. Uh, both of them older than me. Um, six and seven years older than me. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I do. Ram, are we ever going to know your real name? Also, maybe in real life uh, blog sometime. Well, my real name is Javier. Um, which is pretty funny because for English speaking people it's very hard to pronounce. Because they don't really use the <laughs> of Javier. So it's time I'm introduced into uh, to someone who's English or American. I have a laugh because it's like Javier, Javier. No, it's Javier. <laughs> Javier. Um, about the blog, maybe it's an idea. Yeah, why not? I might. I don't. I don't really know at this moment. I have never thought about it. But now you mention it, why not? We'll see. How how old are you? Where do you live? Well, I actually actually said where do I live. So how old I am? I'm 35 years old. Uh, what's your real job and are you married? Well, my real job I'm not going to reveal. I mean, I don't want to give away a lot of about me. Uh, am I married? No, but I know who do I want to be my my wife in the future. Uh, what are your thoughts on R uh, FRB? Oh, this is actually about the game. Well, whatever. Have you tried it? Did you enjoy it? Have you ever considered doing videos on it, etc.? Well, for real battles, is a game mode that, that I would love to play in in War Thunder, but I'm not going to. At least not for now. Uh, I have already spoken about my uh, problem with my right eye uh, side and how I got it corrected with laser. And I also actually have also answered that I have actually flown a couple times. Uh, last time I flew was after the surgery. Now let me tell you something. Um, uh, in real life you have two eyes. And both eyes, being in different positions of your face, are getting slightly different images. And the brain mixes them up. up. Uh, and uh, from mixing them up, the brain gets a proper feeling of distance and closer rates and perception of how deep are things is 3D, 3D uh, view and you are seeing things in um, three dimensions um, you develop that skill uh, when you are maybe from 10 to 13 years old is the time when your brain actually develops that skill when I was that age I had a perfect eye and another one that wasn't perfect and the brain was actually uh, good enough, the images I was getting from my right eye. Uh, so most of my view came from the left eye. Basically, I never developed that kind of view when I was young, because I couldn't. You have to have very similar views, uh, qualities in both eyes. Otherwise, the brain won't mix the, the images. Um, so the first times I flew, actually, I was flying, <laughs> seeing things in 2D in two dimensions because I have never developed the skill to see things in 3D. Uh, but the last time I flew was after the surgery and I have gone through some series of... Um, I mean, I, I, I was doing practices to develop that skill, uh, 3D view. I will never have the same uh, depth perception as a, pe as a person with perfect eyesight because that guy developed it naturally when he was a kid and I got to do it when I was 30 years old but I gained a little bit of perception and I can tell you the first times I flew and the last time I flew it was night and day the last time I flew I was seeing everything with such clear detail because I mean I could see other aircraft much clearer than before because I have a much better perception of, of that they were closer than the back background. I don't know if I explain myself. Basically, having 3D view is amazing compared with two dimensions view. Uh, back to the game. You are playing in a flat screen, which is two dimensions. And you don't get any perception of depth from the screen. Um, and as such, you don't get the real information a real pilot would get in a plane uh, because there's no stereoscopic uh, vision in, in War Thunder nor in any other combat um, simulator on PC because it's a flat screen 
Um, what I'm trying to tell is that in full real battles there are no visual cues to see other planes. Other, I mean, basically enemy planes. You don't get a perception of, of how far they are, or how fast they are coming in or moving away. And that's far from realistic. That's harder, but that's not full real mode. So that's on one hand. On the other hand, if you don't have any visual cues on enemy planes, and you have a pretty crappy computer, like mine, you are put at a natural disadvantage compared with someone who has three monitors of mm, 30 inches each and a late, uh, latest generation computer. And I'm strongly opposed against any kind of flight simulator that gives advantage to um, pilot, a virtual pilot, because he has a better hardware. And with no visual cues, icons of some sort, the guy who's playing in a small screen with a crappy computer is at a natural disadvantage compared with the guy who has a big screen and a massive computer. So, and since some kind of visual cues are added into full real battles, I'm not playing it at all. I'm totally and frontally opposed to that kind of design decision and my way of protesting and saying, no way, Jose, is not flying it. So no, I'm not flying it. I have considered doing so, doing so but I'm not doing it. Um, Ram, what have you studied? Well, I started um, studying uh, physics when I was 17 years old and I got into the university for the first time. But after I completed uh, three courses of physics, I, well, I was under um, some problems. I mean, I love physics. It's a career I would love uh, having completed, but on one hand, the laboral future prospects weren't very good because I got into physics because I wanted to be an astrophysic. I couldn't be a pilot, so I had to do something else. And astrophysics in Spain is not a um, career with a lot of future unless you have a perfect and incredible uh, standard record, which I didn't because I was quite the party guy back then. Uh, that on one hand, the future wasn't, look, wasn't looking very bright for me if I kept on going on that. And on the other hand, I was living with my parents. I was 21 years old at that moment, and I really wanted to go away. I couldn't stand it anymore. You know how it is. You are young. You are still living under your parents with their rules. And uh, I really felt aficionated. So I simply moved. moved. I moved to Madrid, uh, started and I changed careers because, as I said, the future wasn't looking very bright if I kept on going with physics. And I changed it for computer engineering. And that's where I got a degree from. Um, why is your accent so cool? I don't think it's cool. And in fact, I'm getting a lot of um, a lot of comments from people who say that they can't understand me. I'm sorry, but well, it is that we that in this way. I wish I had a better accent, but I don't. So <laughs> my best way to improve is to keep on doing this and to practice on, uh, on the flight. There's no other way. Um, what single event in history would you have wanted to be a witness to, and why? And also, do you think you'll be doing more subscriber events, like custom battles and the like in the game? Uh, for the latter, definitely, yes, yes. I have a lot of fun in those events. I simply need to know when I have, when I'll have a free um, evening, and announce another one. So, but yeah, yeah, there will be more of them. Of course, there will. As for the first question, single event in history that you would have wanted to see, the speech of the mountain. Um, I'm not a huge religious guy. I do believe there's something higher than us, uh, and that there's some, something after life. I don't think there's a God in the way the Christians or Islam, Muslim or whatever. I mean, I think religion is a human creation and humans are prone to failure and religion as such can't be anything like the human humans have made of them to be. But I do think there's something else. And um, there's this particular uh, historical mm, person I would love to meet because I do think he existed, actually. 
and I do think there was something going on with him. Don't ask me ask me why because I don't know, but I do think there was something with him. And of course that's that's Jesus. And um I would love I would love to be able to witness in person the speech of the mundane. Of course all we have right now are um quotes from books written by men saying what happened there. But as I said, as I said, human memory is prone to failure and religion is prone to modification for done by people who are controlling that religion. But I do think that something massively incredible went on there. Because we are speaking about year I mean, he was the first century. And from people to be doing such a speech of um, equal rights between people, we are all the same. Um, well, it's, it's something I would utterly love to see and witness. No, no, no question about that. So yeah, that's that's it. Probably the speech of the mountain by by Jesus. I would love to see it. Uh, well, those are more or less the more personal questions I forgot. Um, let's see more. Are you optimistic about the future? Well, more this time of the of the game. Are you optimi uh, optimistic about the future of this game and the direction the devs are planning to take it? Um, yes, but with my reserves. I do know some devs, and I know a good chunk of the flight model developers of the international team. Of course, I don't know any of the Russian team. If the game is developed the way those developers want to mm, develop it, yes, I have a super optimistic view about the future. But I'm starting to get the idea that they are not the ones making uh, the one making the uh, the ones making the calls. They are the ones making the flight models of some planes. Um, and that means that there will be or might be some calls that they are not making and I don't know who the, pe the people who are making those calls and so far I have seen highly questionable calls made into this game and in quick succession still the game is awesome the potential is incredible the ideas are amazing so yes, I'm optimistic, but I have my own reserves about it. Yeah, I do. But overall, yes, I'm optimistic. Next question. What plane do you want to see in game the most? Any for cool find any? Any of them. <laughs> I simply love the plane, what I'm going to do. And this goes hand to hand with another question I have been asked a lot in the, in the question list. Um, my favorite plane is the for cool find any. All the family. So I want to see all the focal panels from the A1 to the A9, uh, the D9, and uh, some ground attack versions other than the F8, the F3, the F2, the G series. So any focal panel I want to see in the game. Uh, could you do a K4 review? Um, do you think it's dirty to use the D12? Uh, yes, I will do a K4 review. There's no doubt about it. About the D12 and the D13 and all that thing. I don't think it's dirty or clean to use any plane in the game. I mean, it's in the game, it's there, you are free to use it if you want. And it's not dirty if you fly, if you fly it. But, however, I learned to, I learned to fly uh, flight uh, simulators in very realistic environments and um, the only way to learn fast is to challenge yourself and not going for the easiest plane around the most powerful one because that way you are not, not going to learn you are just going to take advantage of the fact that you are in a superior plane and you will learn very very slowly if anything and that's what gets me people who don't want to learn they simply want to have success and this is success that's not the way to get good at anything and it's not the way to be good at this game and also I think it's a little bit of fair because I mean the D13 is a plane that is very very exp very very good and there's very very least and ri very little risk attached to flying it. The D12 I'm okay with. 
the same as the with, uh, with the K4 and with the TA-152. Those planes are super expensive to repair. Super expensive. And if you are willing to put um, 55,000 uh, lions on the line of fire, then do so. And it's okay. The problem with the D-13 is not only that it's very, very powerful, because it is, but that it is as cheap as a P-51. And that's not fair, to be honest. For such a powerful plane, that reaper cost is simply not fair. But I don't think it's dirty. I mean, you are free to play whatever plane you have earned the right to fly. Period. It's in the game. If you have it, you have all the rights to fly it. So, yeah, that's my take on it. Yet more questions. Um, what did you do over those two weeks when you were gone? That made you so happy when you <laughs> when you came back. <laughs> okay, okay. I see what you did there. <laughs> uh, what a question. Um, what did I do? Party hard. Very, very hard. Um, something I didn't do in in a long, long time before that. I mean, since I left the university, I have become a lot less uh, less uh, the party guy I was. And lately, I was used to under the pressure of so many things going wrong or not going my way. And uh, I really needed a break. I didn't notice I needed it until I actually got the break and started enjoying it. Uh, so what did I do? Party hard and all the things that are <laughs> that come hand to hand with partying. I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> what a question. <laughs> uh, next one. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. How did you meet Jingles? Oh, well, this is a, a nice one. Actually, guys, you should thank Jingles because without him this channel would never exist. I can tell you that. Uh, the first time I heard about Jingles was maybe one year ago, more or less. Well, actually, at the end of the last year summer, I was just uh, looking around for um, World of Tanks videos because, well, I mean, I played World of Tanks and uh, I enjoyed it seeing good people playing it. So I was a subscriber of High Flyer, I was a subscriber of. Uh, a lot of people who were putting up uh, videos of Dorian, that kind of stuff. And um, by coincidence, in one of the links that were on the right side of the YouTube uh, screen when I was seeing one of the videos, there was a video from Jingles. And I clicked on it, and it was one of the... I think it was one of the TD um, um, contests. Uh, the, he at that point he was making a huge contest with uh, prizes for the best videos in both in all the categories of um, tanks in the game, light tanks, medium tanks, heavy tanks, tank destroyers, and artillery. And I simply started seeing in the videos he had post up, and I simply got hooked. Hooked. I mean, he's such a charming guy. He's so fun, so to see. Uh, he's so entertaining, and he's got such a charming voice, and I mean, I had a lot of fun seeing those videos, so I subscribed, and since then, I was watching everything he was putting up. I guess, like most of you guys did when you found jing uh, you found Jingles, and subscribed to him. Um, well, some time went by, and in January, he started putting up War Thunder videos, and it was instant love. I see. I mean, I saw his first War Thunder video, and I was like, I have to unload, the, uh, download this, and try it. I downloaded uh, War Thunder, I gave it a go, and I started playing it. So yeah, there you go. I am a War Thunder ga uh, player because of Jingles. That's the first thing. The second thing is that well, I went on playing. I w was having. A pretty good success and was moving on the tiers pretty quick and uh, well some time later Jingles put up a video about the Soviet fighters and how badly they did suck yeah you hear that he thought Soviet planes were full of shit um, 
he put up a video I think with a LG G3 and a Jack um, playing and he wasn't getting any success with them and of course I mean I was watching the video and I could see and spot why he was having no success so instead of putting up a comment which actually I was pretty active in Jingo's comments back then instead of putting up a comment what I did was to do a video response I simply downloaded a um, free recorder uh, fraps and I captured some footage of me flying Soviet planes with a free version of fraps and then some shitty editor, I don't know, which also was free and I put up a video which is an absolute disgrace which is my first video <laughs> in my channel uh, which is, I mean, you can't get worse quality horrible visual quality, horrible sound quality I speak very very quickly and very very, uh, I mean it's very hard, it's hard to it's hard for me to understand myself watching that video but still I had a lot of fun doing so so well after that was up, uh, uploaded and it was on, on YouTube I posted a video answer to Jingles uh, on his uh, video about Soviet planes but I had a lot of fun and I was like hey this is cool why not doing any more than this and I stopped for a second and thought well what can I do with a channel that it's useful for other people and is going to make other people come to my channel and watch my videos and I decided for doing plane analysis because well I know a lot of plane about planes I lot of, know a lot about World War II and uh, I was sure that people would enjoy or at least benefit from seeing that kind of videos and that's how I started so yeah because of Jingles as well uh, later on I was getting some subscribers I mean I may might have been at 500 or so subscribers and um, people started saying that I should fly with Ingalls uh, <laughs> and this was funny because I contacted him in game uh, he had actually knew me I mean I had posted a video comment I was active in his comment sections of the, of the video so he knew me so he knew me but you know that Jingles is having a lot of problem with his spam and a lot of people um, contacting him in game and up to ridiculous points to be honest uh, so I contacted him like fearing he was not going to answer me because he was so full of uh, questions from anyone else but to his credit he actually was super super um, nice to me he actually, actually answered we had a couple nice chats and well we actually spoke to each other like well, yeah well, we, we should fly together at one point but time went by it didn't happen until much later but still I mean I only have good words for what Jingles have done for me I mean most of you who are watching this came here because of his comments in his videos about me so you can imagine how much I owe him and how grateful I, I am so yeah that's my story with Ingalls next one do you party a lot if no if not no did you in university oh hell yes I did <laughs> I was quite the party guy actually when I moved to Madrid and I got into a new circle of friends I got to new a lot of new people and well, I had a lot of fun um, actually those guys and my old uh, university friends it's time I see them they still call me by the nickname I had back then which was dancing yeah dancing <laughs> why well because no matter when where we went a uh, bar a pub a disco whatever if there was a place I could uh, step on and step up and stay all night long dancing up there I would do so, do so. it's not that I danced well it's simply that I had fun dancing and I didn't give a shit about what anyone else could think about my dancing so I simply went up and well yeah dancing uh, I had a lot of partying during my university years a lot a lot I enjoyed it immensely and I still do when I go out in a party uh, but of course, I mean, not not el not as much as I did back then. First of all, I'm 33 years, uh, 30, 35 years old, uh, 
back then I was 21, 25, so I mean, you get older and your body stops um, letting you do things you were used to, used to do. And so I go, well, I mean, I'm a little bit, bit more mature and um, I'm, I mean, the work is gets you tired and you want, you want more or less calm weekends. But yeah, I'm, I'm quite the party guy. I'm still, um, but not as much as, as back then. Uh, next one. How many flight sims games or real life aircraft have you had experience with in order to become such a lipid encyclopedia of all things aviation? <laughs> well, thanks for that. Um, I, I do know a lot about points. There's no question about that. Um, it's a long, long, long while of... Um, a long time of... of it being my hobby since I was a, a kid. Uh, about my real uh, experience with planes, I have already spoken about it. About uh, the virtual experience, well, my first flight simulator, serious flight simulator, uh, came when I was uh, seven years old, in 1948. Or maybe 1948, 45. Well, more or less when I was 80 years old. I, uh, back then I had, well, actually my sisters had, but I was using it all the time and they weren't. Um, they had an Amstrad CPC, which back then was the direct competitor to the Spectrum. And, uh, well, my parents bought me a, a game about planes. They simply thought it was a game about planes, which was called Spitfire 40. Yes, you heard it. My first flight simulator was that of a Spitfire. <laughs> But even for the very limited resources and computer technology of the AIDS, it was a pretty advanced one. And um, I mean, I was a kid, I had no idea what I was doing, but I was having fun. So I simply started to learn back then. I mean, the thing was so complicated that the instructor instru instruction book of the game came with a complete chapter about um, air combat tactics and the Volker dictates the golden rules of air combat, which were detected by a German ace in World War One. They are were actually in that little book, and I started learning a lot of things about planes there. Um, the first time I knew that in a compass, 90 degrees is the east, 180 degrees is south, and 290 is west, came from that game. I learned a lot. And that was my first one. Since then, well, you name a famous or well-sold uh, flight simulator and I have used it. All of them. All of them I have. Up to maybe four or five years ago. Um, which I stopped flying simu flight simulators because I was... I, wa I, I was burned. I mean... I have had so much of it that it reached a point when it stopped being fun, so I needed a break. I moved on to other kind of things, uh, but I'm a huge fan of all simulations, uh, not just uh, flight simulators. I've um, played uh, Silent Hunter, all of them, submarine simulators, um, Dangerous Waters, Modern Naval Simulator, I have uh, flown a lot of helicopter simulators, starting with Gunship for the Amstrad and later Gunship 2000 for PC and not that long ago uh, Black Shark, which is a incredibly realistic um, PC uh, simulation of the Kamov K-50 um, Russian helicopter. So it's a huge list. list. I mean, you name it, I flew it. Uh, Battle of Britain from LucasArts, Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe from LucasArts as well, European Air War, um, the F-15 series, uh, Strike Eagle, uh, Falcon series, uh, SU-27, uh, the flanker, Lomac, um, that's lock-on, modern air combat for you, um, I mean, <laughs> you, you name it, I flew it. <laughs> so basically everything and my first online um, air combat simulator was SSI in 1999 shortly after I got a connection f 
phone to the internet in in my home in my house in in home. Uh, so yeah, that's more or less is uh, more or less it. I mean, not more or less. There are hundreds of uh, flight simulators I have used. So it's a big list, very big list. And uh, well, one more question, and I'll stop it here. And uh, the next ones will be in part two, which is going to come maybe later today or tomorrow. How much time, much time and practice you spend for reaching at least a good level? It seems to me that mastering air combat is pretty difficult and demanding. It is. And uh, this goes on with what I answered before about the Dora 13 in the game. To, I mean, you have heard that I have flown all the flight co combat flight simulators you can think of. Of course, including the combat flight simulator from Microprose, uh, uh, from sorry, from Microsoft, uh, European Air War, Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe, you name it, I flew it. But all of them were single uh, player games. And actually, I was flying them with somewhat um, downgraded realistic settings. I wasn't really doing very well when I had torque options on, for instance, or gyroscopic effects on. So I simply toned it a little bit down to enjoy. But when I got my first um, internet connection at home, which was back in the 1999s, 1999 to be exact and precise, I got into this, um, uh, just released, I mean it was open bet beta and almost going into gold status, which was SSI, a game that still lives on today under the name SSI 2. Um, and going into that game, even while I have read a lot, a lot about planes, uh, air combat, and I had experienced it myself, in computer simulations, up to the point that I have been able to get into a plane, take it off, fly around and land it. I actually have uh, already told this story. Even then, um, I mean, that game had no arcade mode. Okay, it didn't have historical mode either. It was very similar to for. So just imagine yourself getting to War Thunder for the first time and playing arcade. Well, I was exactly more or less, maybe I knew a little bit more of theory than you, than when you moved into War Thunder, maybe, who knows, I don't know exactly how much you knew about air combat when you moved in. <coughs> but I wasn't much better than your average newbie in War Thunder right now. And SSI had no arcade. It had just one game mode, which was the same, more or less, than what it is for realism right now. Except for the icons. That game had actually icons. But the flight models were super demanding. Um, the f model of the physics was super realistic. And as a result, what was working in single mm, player mode wasn't in that game. Um, on top of that, um, that game was full of people who had several years of experience in exactly the same kind of game. They all came from a l older uh, um, combat simulator w which was called Warbirds. And they all were expert pilots. Expert virtual pilots. There weren't many. I mean, m a full arena back then maybe was 70 people. So, yeah, but they all knew a lot. They were experts. They were aces, and I was a noob who had no actually no uh, no real clue on what he has doing. He was doing. On top of that, the plane of choice that I picked picked when I moved into the game was the Focul Fun NA8, which was by far the hardest one to master because it couldn't turn, it could climb. It only could boom and zoom. But of course I was a newbie and I was trying to turn in it. And it was one full week before I got my first aerial combat kill. I simply didn't know what I was doing wrong. I didn't. I just was doing the same I was doing in European Air War in single player mode 
and in single player world I was getting a ton of kills on the AI but against players I simply couldn't do crap I was getting killed out, killed all the time I couldn't shoot down anything and uh, at one point I was very near quit quitting to be honest but mm, then a guy came around we started, we got to meet each other because he shot me down in the game actually and he noticed that I was a newcomer that I I mean, who had no clue what he was doing. So he actually took me under his wing and um, took the time, spent the time, uh, invested the time to teach me the basics of air combat. And uh, from then I started learning what I was doing wrong and what to do to become better. And uh, also it happened that I was using the most challenging plane in the plane set. I mean, there was no room for error in a Focus 190 in that game. If you mess it up with that plane, going up against planes that all of them, without exception, climbed better, accelerated better, and turned it better, one mistake, you were done. So it was very challenging, but I didn't want to give the plane up because the Fog Wolf 190 was my favorite plane. No matter how full, I mean, how hard it was to fly, no matter how bad it seemed to be. And believe me, it wasn't. The problem was that it was hard to master. Um, so I sold it on. Instead of going for the easy plane to get fast results, I kept on the hardest plane of the plane set. And also, I mean, I told you I have read a lot about air combat before that. I actually have float, uh, flown a lot of combat simulators back before coming into the game. So I had the theory more or less in place. But when I started using it for real in a simulator for the first time, things started clicking in. And uh, things I had already learned in, in a book, like Boom and Thun, what it is. I, I knew what it was, Boom and Thun, but I simply wasn't doing it because I wasn't good at doing it. Um, I had no clue on how to conserve energy, air combat maneuvers, I knew uh, very, very little about them. Um, but as soon as I got started and teached the basics, everything clicked very fast, very quickly. Helped by the fact that I was in a, per in a plane that didn't forgive mistakes, so I had to fly it right. Uh, maybe in... I mean, I started flying SSI in late 1999 and by the early year 2000 I was already known in that game as uh, probably the most dangerous for Gulf and any pilot in the game. Maybe two, three months is what it took me to get to be very good. Uh, then again, I never stopped learning. I still learn today. But... Um, yeah, I think more or less three or four months. But remember, that was a very unforgive me, unforgiving game with very realistic flight models and I was flying the hardest plane in the game. I didn't go for the easy plane. I mean, I didn't go for the Spitfire, which was a lot more forgiving than the Focal Fun Any. I didn't go for the easy success success i went for the i stuck i was stuck into the focal fan and i simply didn't want to quit it first of all because it was my favorite plane of the plane set not just not because it was the best because it wasn't obviously but because i loved the plane and second because i knew it was the challenging one and the best one to learn in because it was the hardest so that's why so many people in Dora 13 are getting, is getting me. P that, that, that people are never going to learn. Never, ever. They go for the easy way out, and they go for the quick success, and as such, they will never succeed. Um, it took me three months in the most, I mean, the hardest environment you can think. In a very hard game, with very hard flight models, very realistic ones without proper controls because I didn't have rudders back then. I was using rudders with keyboard and I was using a mm, very simple joystick. Of course, later on I purchased pedals and oh, that was a huge difference. Um, 
and also going against guys who have years of experience. It's a case of either you sink or swim, <laughs> and I swim it. And uh, maybe six months after I started flying, I got the combat I am the most proud of in my whole career as a virtual pilot. By pure chances, I met, I don't know if you know him, a guy called Robert So, Bob So, who is the author of um, Fighter Combat Tactics and Maneuvering, which is the Bible of um, air to air combat. Uh, he's a former uh, US Navy um, pilot, and his book was used as the Bible on places like Top Gun in Nellis, uh, for the Air Forces as well, uh, Top Gun in Miramar from the US Navy. And, um, well, this guy, actually, I got to fly a fight versus him. I didn't know it was him at the moment. Uh, he was in a Jack 9U, and I was in a Focus 190A5. And uh, he actually started with the advantage because he was behind me and catching up fast. And I'm still, um, 13 years later, I still remember that fight as it just happened 20 minutes ago. And in, I mean, at that point, I graduated myself as a good pilot because I bet I beat him, I actually shot him down. Um, but that took a long time. That took a lot of effort from my side and that took me never going the easy way out or the easy route. Um, yeah, well, that's it for now. I mean, it's been a long while and a long session so far. I will answer the rest of the questions and any more that are incoming in part two of this q a answer session thank you very much for watching guys hope you enjoyed and see you later